Hi everyone, just a couple quick announcements before I get started. Uh, we're still having our holiday sale, which is 20% off all downloads in our store through the end of the month. Um, we are currently doing our holiday giving drive. Um, we're almost to the halfway point and we have a little over two weeks left. Um, so if you can help us reach our $25,000 goal, that would be really great. You can just go to youngchicago.org slash give. Thanks to everyone who has given already. Uh, and if you're thinking about making a contribution, you would be supporting the Institute and helping everyone who uh, receives this podcast for free. Also, if you are thinking of applying for the analyst training program, the deadline is January 15th. Um, so you have about a month left. Much of it is done online. So if you just go to youngchicago.org slash ATP, all the information you need about applying is there. Thanks. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology podcast from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Jung in the world, Jung's two personalities and their impact on Jungian thought and training with Mark Sabin. Mark Sabin joins us to talk about the complexity of Jung's own personality and how that has shaped the way analysts are trained today. Mark Sabin is a psychotherapist, analytical psychologist, and Jungian analyst in the UK. He is a senior analyst with the Independent Group of Analytical Psychologists and registered as a Jungian analyst with the United Kingdom Council for Psychotherapy and the International Association for Analytical Psychology. He gained an MA at Oxford University and worked for 20 years as a performer and writer in theater, TV, and film before training as an analytical psychologist. He completed his PhD at the University of Essex, where he also works as a lecturer in the department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies. He is the author of Two Souls, Alas, Carl Jung's Two Personalities and the Making of Analytical Psychology. Patricia Martin is interviewing him as part of this series and her full bio is in the show notes. Now here's the interview. Hello, this is Patricia Martin and welcome to Jungian Anthology. I'm a professional affiliate at the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago and I'll be your host today. In this series, we'll be talking with people whose work intersects with Jung's ideas to tell a more contemporary story of his enduring impact in a brave new world. In this interview, I'm joined by Mark Sabin, a Jungian analyst in private practice working out of Oxford, England. Mark also enjoys teaching Jungian studies at the University of Essex. His book, Two Souls, Alas!, Carl Jung's Two Personalities and the Making of the Analytic Psychology has won several awards. He joins us today to talk about the complexity of Carl Jung's own personality and how that has shaped the way analysts are trained today. Welcome, Mark. You're the, you're the author of uh, several books, but the one that fascinated me is Two Souls Alas, Jung's Two Personalities and the making of analytic psychology. I know that a writer is very specific when he or she chooses a title. So two souls, comma, alas, intrigued me. Can you tell me a little bit more about what your intentions were when you chose that title? Yes. Um... Um, the 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 quote it's a you know it's it's a it's a quotation from Goethe's Faust, um, which was a work that we know Jung very much admired and and was inspired by, uh, and had a lifelong relationship with, um, and uh, uh, it just leapt out at me that particular line leapt out at me as being absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, summarizing really what I, exactly what I'm I'm attempting to unpack in the book. 
which is uh, to, uh, a, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll talk a bit later, I, I, I hope about, about, you know, the kind of background to where the book came from for me and why I wanted to write it. But uh, in brief, um, I, I, I take the, uh, the first few chapters of Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung's memoir, he, he talks at some length about his struggles with what he describes as his two personalities, which he imaginatively calls personality number one and personality number two. And uh, the, 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 the struggle that he underwent um, uh, flipping from one personality to the other and eventually coming to the conclusion that he really, in order to be a whole person, to live a whole life, he absolutely needed to allow, somehow anyway, allow both these personalities to be present in his life, which is not an easy thing. We're not talking about an easy kind of integration. Oh, you know, just stick the two together and then move on. It's it's they're, they're opposites, so they're difficult opposites, and so it was a struggle for Jung, uh, but it can and it continued to be a struggle. I think this is one of the other points I try to make in the book is that this doesn't stop. He doesn't sort of grow out of this problem. It's a problem that continues right the way through his life, uh, and and indeed his creative life, and uh, and and you know ultimately his psychology. Uh, revolves around the, exactly these problems that emerge out of this difficult tension between these two dimensions of life, if you like. Uh, and, and, yeah, two souls, alas, it's alas because it's tough. You know, it's not, it's not, an, easy, it's not an easy path. Um, and, and because, I mean, the way I see it anyway, uh, it's, it's interminable. You know, you, you don't get there. There's no, there's no wonderful... Uh, uh, achievement at the end there's no wonderful goal where you arrive and ah oh, yes I've done it now I'm individuated I, I, don't, I don't believe that's that ever happens I don't think there is such a thing I think as long as you're alive this 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 tension continues and and indeed that's it's it's out of this tension that that life comes and the the creativity of life and really being alive uh, that's that's the way I see it and I think that that's pretty well the way Jung sees it I hope so anyway um yeah, so that was that was that was the kind of inspiration that you know that that line just 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 seemed to me to really um, encapsulate this 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 difficult tension. Well, uh, when I read your introduction, it was very clear to me that you had done your homework on on the context in which analytical psychology was born and Jung's role in that and what that context looked like and came to you at some point that you, while you had learned a lot from that, it was time to really focus on Jung. So what I'm curious about is why did you want to do all that homework? Why did you want to write this book? Yes. Well, that, that, that uh, came out of something that, uh, I, you know, I'd been, I'd been working as, as a, as a Jungian analyst for a number of years. Um, and I'd also had a sort of sideline in teaching about Jung. Um, I first of all started teaching on a, on a um, drama therapy course. I taught the students there about Jung. And I realized that I enjoyed teaching. Uh, and, you know, I enjoyed the interaction. I enjoyed the connection, which, was, which made a change from the kind of slightly lonely life of being, being an analyst. And uh, uh, I... Um, I realized that the reason I liked the other reason I liked teaching, apart from the fact that it meant that I was kind of with people and interacting with people in, in this way was, was that it, uh, it, 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 I couldn't teach it without real, you know, without understanding it. And I realized quite quickly that the things that I thought I understood, I maybe didn't understand quite so well. So it took, kept taking me back to, to, to working on this stuff. And one of the things that kept coming back for me as a problem is this idea of the opposites. So, you, you know, as you know, you can't open a page of Jung without finding him sort of referring to this, what he calls the problem of the opposites or the opposites, you know, the opposites comes up all the time. And, and, and yet when I kind of looked around for a book on, on this, I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll get some help from somewhere. But I couldn't really find anything out there. I couldn't find, uh, there weren't very many articles that looked at this question and there were no books. So I thought, well, there's a gap in the market. You know, somebody, somebody really should 
uh, should 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 take a look at this and and you know work it up a bit. And um, after a while, um, my interest in teaching extended, so I found myself teaching at uh, the University of Essex uh, in in a relatively small way at that stage. And after a while, I started thinking, well, you know, there are two things I'd like to do here. One is I, I you know, I had an ambition. I, you know, I wanted at some point to write a book and this felt like my topic for some reason. This felt like something that, that I, you know, for, for, for the reasons I've mentioned, uh, this was something that I wanted to get into. Um, but I also wanted to get to, to get a Ph.D., I wanted to do more teaching and I wanted to, 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 to have, you know, be involved in the academic life slightly more. So I thought, well, I need a PhD in order to do that. So, you know, kill two birds with one stone. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do the PhD and the PhD will be, you know, what comes out of the PhD will be the book. And so, uh, uh, and that obviously, uh, as you can imagine, involved me in taking it pretty seriously in terms of research. So I really did have to get down to it in terms of um, researching the topic. Um, and I, um, you know, I immediately, uh, I, I sort of dived in uh, the deep end because this the, the idea of the opposites, you know, crops up in all sorts of different arenas. But I mean, particularly in philosophy, comes comes up in linguistics as well. And so I, I kind of explored all that. I wrote a, this huge, uh, you know, uh, detailed first chapter, as it was supposed to be, all about, um, you know, uh, Aristotle and the excluded middle and, um, you know, um, Schelling and Hegel and what 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 have you? And then after a while, I realised that this was this wasn't taking me anywhere near Jung. It was, uh, if anything, I was I was heading off into the ether. And I thought, well, this isn't this isn't going to work. So I can't do that. So I mean, I'm I'm glad I did that research, but but I then thought, well, I've got to really really ground this in Jung. And if you ground it in Jung, that doesn't mean grounding it necessarily in his ideas, although that's obviously part of it. It means grounding it in Jung's life, Jung's experience. Because one thing I have found about Jung is, is that his ideas all stem from his life. You know, he, he lives this stuff. He lives it first, and then he, and then he develops the ideas. Uh, well, you know, some think is, some think is, yeah. I, well, the thing that was also fascinating to me about that is, you know, he, he admits that he, he, sure. he says yeah, yeah. In, an open, in an open no. speech. He's proud he, of it. Yeah. I mean, he, 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 he thinks that that, and that's what, you know, he, he constantly calling himself an empiricist. And I think that's what he means more than anything else. He means this stuff is grounded in my life. I didn't just think it up and then sort of look around and see if it fitted. I lived it. And then the idea emerged from the living, um, so which, is, which is, which is a strength. I think that is a strength. In, oh, in psychology, you know, in a mechanistic scientific yeah. world, there yeah. would be people who say no. Absolutely. To that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That yeah. it's not empirical enough if it's coming from you. Yeah. yeah. But isn't and that interesting? Experience. Because, absolutely. And and the, but you know immediately one one gets into this this the, you know the, these these two opposites again because because you've got this kind of um, scientific mechanistic. Uh, 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 you know, the, the worshipping of the objective, um, you know, separation of, of the observer and the thing observed and so on. You've got that side of science. But Jung's, Jung, uh, which Jung, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't reject that. It's not that he says, no, that's all nonsense. You know, I've, 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 I've intuited the, the truth about things and that's all you need to, you know, pay. He's not, he's not a prophet in that sense. He doesn't just, he doesn't kind of say he's, he's, he's had a vision and here it is. I mean, he does do that, but he also is very keen to connect it to the other aspect of science, this, this scientific, uh, you know, the, the, the rigour of science, if you like. He wants it to be rigorous. And the place where, where the two meet, I think, is in this idea of experience, because it's, it's objectively true. You know, he does have the experience. One, you know, psychological life is something that is real, as he continually insists on. Now, these are realities, uh, but they don't quite, you know, if you look at science, in, you know, the, or, or, or knowledge in a one-sided way, you end up with this rather denuded, one-sided, thin version, which is this mechanistic version of science. So that's not enough on its own. You need the other side. 
But then you've got the difficulty of how do you fit these two things together? Because they don't, they're not natural bedfellows. Because as you say, the scientists, you know, the, the strict scientists will immediately dismiss all that and say, well, then there's no room for that in science. So he's trying to do this thing of bring these two difficult things together uh, in some way. And it's out of that, I think, again, out of that tension between the two that his science, if you like, analytical psychology emerges. And that's what one of the things that makes it so interesting. But it's uh, it's a struggle. Again, it's it's a constant struggle to to keep these these two together. Well, I was thinking about that when, you know, at the top of our, our conversation, you were talking about how the the balancing of these two souls, the balancing of these mm. two personalities is mm. is ever present in our lives it's yeah. so in other words it, we're always emergent we're always emerging exactly. and, and yet uh, you know individuation is a Jungian theory that is yeah. you know very much premised on getting somewhere eventually <laughs> you know eventually the person if they're attuned um they become more whole, you know, there is a prize at the end of the struggle. So how yeah. does individuation and, yeah. and this idea of the two types, you know, the, the, the kind of yeah. the warring of the two types or, yeah. or, or yeah. balancing the two types, how, how do those concepts fit together? Or, or maybe they don't at all. No, I think they do. Um, but I think it's it it the way I the, the way I think it works is is that I mean I, I see individuation I'm absolutely with I think individuation is the kind of central concept in analytical so I think that's that's the key you know the absolute you know the, everything revolves around individuation it seems to me now individuation is very much a process uh, so it's all about uh, you know um, it's all about change it's about it's about change it's about transformation it's all about transformation now uh uh the, the 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 kind of motor of transformation in individuation is actually again this same uh uh you know he talks about the transcendent function the transcendent function which is a crucial uh notion i think for individuation is what emerges out of Again, this difficult coming together of opposites. You 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 find yourself in a situation. Well, I mean, he, there there are various kind of models that he that he uses. But one is that you find yourself in a difficult situation. You don't know. You can't go one way. You can't go the other way. And he says, you, 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 what you need to do is endure this this tension. Just sit with it. And eventually, uh, as if by magic, this this transcendent function occurs. And 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 you find you've moved on to another level. At which point. The, the original tension between the two alternatives no longer seems relevant in a way. You're, you're, you're in a new place now. You see things in a different way, and so you move on. And, and the process of individuation is, is that happening again and again and again and again. But you're right. There is, there is the notion of a goal, but I think it's, it's a temporary goal. It's always a temporary, for me anyway, it's always a temporary goal. You get, you get somewhere and, 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 and you think, wow, that, you know, hey, you know, this is, this is, you know, phew, I, you know, I've emerged. I, I'm, I am somewhere now. Um, I am me now. Uh, and, and, and somehow, I'm not stuck in that earlier phase where where things were difficult and I and I felt felt split. Now I feel that I'm you know I've come back together again in a sense. But of course, almost immediately, the next problem emerges because there's going to be something else along the line. So you have your dream and some horrible shadow figure turns up and and then you're t then you're tackling that and it's the next it's the next thing along you know and you keep. And, and so when Jung talks about this, the process of individuation, as you know, he, he, he talks about it in a kind of slightly linear way, which some people don't like. But I mean, what, what, what you know, he, he says you, you start off dealing with the shadow and then you then you you deal with the or you start off with the persona. Then you start with then you move on to the shadow. Then you move on to the anima or animus and then you move, you know, and so on. There's a, there's a, there's sort of there's a map in a way. Now, yeah, I mean, uh, in my experience, it doesn't quite work out as simply as that. But but I think his point is that you deal with uh, these problems as you go along and you find a kind of solution to the problems. But then then the next problem comes along. So it's the next, the next stage of individuation occurs. And I'm not really convinced that there's a final stage in individuation. I'm not sure you, you, you ever really get there. Um, 
so uh, I, for my money, the, the emphasis should be on the process. It's always the process. And the process always involves this dealing with whatever one wants to call it, the other, the, the, the unknown, the unconscious. You know, it, it, uh, when it comes down to it, the, this meeting of conscious and unconscious, because another model he uses for the idea of the transcendent function is the idea of active imagination. And so in active imagination, your conscious ego is meeting the unconscious and and that difficult that's a difficult tension as well you know as anyone who's ever tried knows it's not easy but but if you can hold that if you can somehow enable that to happen then this something again emerges out of it moves you along takes you to a new place as as we read in the red book i mean the red book is this fantastic uh sort of journey in which jung does exactly that and he comes up against all these problems again and again he comes out you know and they're difficult problems and uh, personified in the, in the case of the Red Book, which is helpful. So I'm curious about your journey. I am yeah. imagining that a book of this depth yeah. is its own process of individuation. And you, you may have, you know, or as Joseph Campbell says about the hero's journey, you know, you, you may have found yourself having a few aha moments. Were there any moments in writing this book that still stand out to you as, you know, either that gestalt moment or that surprising moment when you discovered something about Jung that you had never considered before? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think I'll answer that by, by talking about the shift that happens in the book, really, because when I started the book, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a signed up Jungian. I'm, I'm, I trained as a Jungian analyst. I, I, you know, I teach Jung. Obviously, I'm, I'm deeply embedded in Jung. Uh, and uh, uh, that's my starting point. And I wanted to write uh, a, a book that was Jungian, you know. But the interesting shift for me that happened was that I got kind of halfway through. So I explicated that I got, went into this, this, the way in which this worked for Jung, the way in which the, the tension between the two personalities, you know, we can see something of the similar thing happening in terms of the way he develops the idea of typology, say, again, you've got a superior function, an inferior function. It's the tension between the two is, is the productive thing. You know, that's, that's, that's what Jung's interested in. And uh, and then, you know, he moves on to alchemy and and in alchemy, again, it's all it's all about the opposites. It's all about this. This, you know, I mean, the Mysterium Conjunctionis right towards the end of the uh, end of his life is uh, you know, an inquiry into the separation and synthesis of psychic opposites in alchemy. So this, you know, this 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 constant struggle never goes away. He just finds more and more complex ways to 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 approach it and to deal with it. Um, but. What I started realizing when I when I really looked at the two personalities was that there were aspects of Jung's psychology and the way in which it kind of shows up in modern life, which I think I I realized I thought started to betray a kind of one-sidedness that hadn't quite been resolved. Um, and the, way, the more I thought about it, the, the more it seemed to me that the personality number two aspect of Jung, which, which you rightly identified early on as being the, 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 the bit that Jung really, you know, he, that's the bit he likes. He, he wants to live in personality number two. That's, that's the, his comfort zone is personality number two, if you like, which kind of marks him out because for most people, it's, it's not like that. Most people, I, I suspect it's the other way around, but anyway, for Jung, this was, you know, he, 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 you know, this, this, this arena that he, that he describes in Memories, Dreams, Reflections as God's world. He, he would happily have kind of lain around read books and, and communed with nature and, and just, you know, been at one with eternity. Forever. Right. So person just would, for our audience, the, per yeah. personality too is that yeah. interior personality exactly yeah yeah it goes yeah, to so it's, it's, it's it the bit that's in rocks it, yeah <laughs> exactly uh, i mean he he describes in in memory streams reflections these various experiences he has there's the the underground phallus dream there's the the um 
the the kind of um you know the, he carves this little thing and puts it in a box and 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 that has this special meaning for him and so on so you know there's there's various he sits on a stone and he wonders whether he's he's the one sitting on the stone or whether he's being sat on or whatever so you know the, the, there are certain key experiences that that sort of contribute to this sense that there is a mysterious other world which is which is the world somehow and 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 he can connect with that and and when he's connecting with that world it's god's world and somehow he's part of that and you know so all that stuff that that later i think we can see very clearly becomes his you know these things become his preoccupations in in his in his mature psychology these are these are the things he's fascinated by and he, and and of course you know, there's a good reason for that. There's a good excuse for that because actually, as he points out many times, he lives in, and we live in a culture which is one-sided the other way. So our culture is, you know, doesn't recognise that stuff as as even real. Uh, you know, it 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 wants to concentrate on rationality and and logic and and the material and so on and so forth. So so yeah, I mean, one can understand that 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 he he's drawing attention to to a dimension of things that that a lot of people can't even see. So it's, it was important to, to you know to kind of there's you know he uses this word enantiodromia, which he gets from Heraclitus, which is about things. You know, if things get too one-sided, then they'll, eventually they'll swing across the other way. Mm -hmm. So there's a kind of enantiodromic process here. Things that, that you know, the culture is so one-sidedly personality number one that personality number two needs to, needs to come in and kind of push in and, and take over for a while. But having said all that, which, of course, I agree with, I do think that uh, because Jung, the man, was so caught up in this personality number two stuff and found personality number one stuff a real chore. I mean, he, the way he describes, you know, he reaches this, this point, um, he has this, this wonderful dream, uh, which I can't, haven't got time to go into, but, but at the end of the dream, he comes to the conclusion that he's going to have to, uh, have to live in personality number one. And this is not good news for you at all. He, he doesn't, he's not keen on this, but, it, but he, he describes that it will mean that he'll have to, you know, kind of, he'll have to, you know, get involved in work and relationships and and career and 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 you know, all that, all that kind of, you know, and it's a, it's going to be a real pain for him to, to you know, you get the feeling is, you know, he he sees this, you know, going ahead, but he says, but the crucial thing is, I must never forget personality number two. That will always be. That has to be always there in the background, always present, and then and then I can do that stuff because well, I've that got was the movement. kindling. Yeah, right? exactly. Yes, exactly. it was the kindling that lit the fire yeah. that yeah. made everything yeah. else possible. But you talk about these, you know, these these uh, separateness, the separateness mm -hmm. of these things, and the coming together of mm -hmm. these two personalities for Jung, and what a challenge that was. But it also presented a challenge for the profession of analysts mm -hmm. and the training of analysts. And what I think you're trying to say there is. It presented a problem in that how do Jungian analysts uh, connect with the world? How does Jungianism yeah. connect yeah. with the world? Right. Um, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So, so this is this is where I go in the book. So, it it uh, and, and and in a way, this is you know to get back to your initial question. This this was something that I didn't know was going to happen. I wasn't. I didn't realize that this would lead me in this direction. And I started you know, feeling a bit nervous about it, to be honest, I started thinking, hang on, I'm supposed to be a Jungian. And yet I'm, I'm starting, you know, I'm developing this position, which is kind of critical. And it's, and it's kind of, you know, questioning some of the some of the, you know, deeply held tenets of, of, of Jungian, uh, Jungian thinking. But, I, but I thought, well, hey, you know, I mean, ultimately, I come to the conclusion that that this is, everything needs to individuate and that means Jungian psychology as well and so I mean of course all I'm talking about is my relationship with Jungian psychology that needs to individuate that's the point that's the main point and that's why it matters to me to get back to your your question that's why that this felt like an important thing for me to do because I I felt I needed to to engage with this this little this niggling question that I'd started with, which blew up and became more and more of a problem. But anyway, to answer your second question, uh, yes. So I because what my my, my realization that there was a sort of one sidedness actually in Jungian psychology um, led me to uh, uh, 
query how that showed itself and, and what that meant. And, and as you rightly point out, one of the ways that shows up is because there's a, there's a sort of um, a kind of bias in the direction of the inner, of the archetypal, um, uh, uh, that, 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 that realm is felt somehow to be the crucial realm, the, the, the important bit. That's the bit that we're interested in. And, and as a result, the outer world uh, and, uh, and personality number one tends, oh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it, he never fails to, to nod in the direction of it. He will, he will say things like, of course, the process of individuation, you know, is an inner process. But, you know, it, the great thing is that by, when, you, when you finished it, when you come out the other end, then you can go back into the world and, and it'll be much better. You know, your, your relationships will be better. But it, it seems to me that, that that kind of, there's something missing in that which is about the, 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 it seems to me that the engagement with the world, uh, that dimension of things sh should always be, and according to his own logic of his own notion of individuation, these two things always need to be working off in tension with each other. That's the way we produce the, the third, as it were. That's the way the new thing comes. That that needs to be the case here too, these opposites, this, these opposites of inner and outer, they need to be in touch with each other as well. And so this, this tendency to, to, to only be interested in the inner world of the patient, say, uh, uh, and, and of course, one, one looks at the outer world, one, one, one hears about the outer world, but one tends to interpret it back into the inner world again. It's always, so, so okay, you're having a problem with your girlfriend, but this is really an anima problem. You know, that's the, mm. that's the key thing here. Um, and, and there's a tendency in Jung psychology to, to constantly bring, draw things back into the inner world. Uh, and of course, when you get there, then what you do is you emphasize the archetypal aspect rather than the personal aspect, because, again, that's the thing that Jung's interested in. And that's the, the thing that Jungian analysts are supposed to be interested in. But there's a danger there, I think. And the danger is that it, that it can become a kind of self-enclosed, sort of slightly solipsistic bubble. And it excludes this important, crucial tension with the outer world. Uh, now, I mean, the way in which I look at this in the book is, is to look at some of the, some of, um, the ways in which Jung uh, conducted analyses. And, and I sp specifically go into the case of Christiana Morgan, who was the young American woman who came over to Zurich and uh, went into analysis with Jung. And she produced uh, a an amazing amount of visions, which eventually you know, were turned into the vision seminars of, of Jung. Uh, but if you actually look at you know the, how this how this analysis proceeded, how it went, what actually happened, um, it, it's it, it starts looking more and more like a kind of folie à deux, really, because Jung it constantly brings everything back to the archetypal. He's only interested in the archetypal, and he and he and you can start seeing that you know if you, if you read about this, because there's quite a lot of, of information we have about it. You can see that the. The, 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 the notion, you know, the, the, the fact that she, she arrives in Zurich with this massive and positive transference onto Jung, which has an erotic component, and the relationship of that to her father, she had a father complex, and, and then Jung meets her with a kind of counter-transference, which is very clear in, in the way he, he talks about her and the way he deals with her, but none of that appears to be dealt with in in the analysis it's all about him interpreting the visions interpreting her dreams in an archetypal way and, and that's and interior the, work the two yeah the interior work. It's all about the interior world and the development of the interior world and what's actually going on in the room between this woman and and Jung is is never I mean, obviously, we don't know exactly what happened, but 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 it doesn't seem to have been really dealt with. And the whole thing, you know, it goes off the rails. I mean, it goes so, badly wrong. I wonder, yeah, I wonder about that very issue now. I mean, we hmm. are really living in radically trans transformational times, right? Yes. The digital culture is here. Yeah. It's not yeah. going away. And yeah. it's changing the individuation process. It's what, that's what I see. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so, you know, um, taking one's one's questions or issues or problems um, that are of a psychological nature, and and they come with the big wide world of the web yeah. with yeah. them, 
Yeah. And bringing all of that inside, it seems like it's it's like swallowing a storm. I mean, as a yeah. contemporary analyst working day to day with patients, yeah. are you seeing any of this manifest with your patients? And I know you can't well, be specific, but just in general, what's no, the, but I mean, what's in general, the gestalt I think, there? I mean, I, 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 I mean, I think the, the best possible example in this, 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 you know, you couldn't help but let this in uh, was the whole, pan, you know, is the whole pandemic, the whole COVID thing. It, it, it uh, uh, there was this 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 shift that that really happened around the, the beginning of 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 the pandemic, where one re I realized that uh, not only was the whole uh, way of doing analysis changed, uh, because because it all had to be done on Zoom and so on or, or whatever. I mean, it had to be done through the internet, mm -hmm. and that changed it in all kinds of ways that were not immediately apparent. Uh, but but also just the, the simple fact that, that the thing that was on everyone's mind and the thing that they were dealing with on in an inner and an outer way, and, 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 and this affected every aspect of their life, their psychic life and every other aspect of their life, was the fact that this huge uh, global catastrophe was going on. And, 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 and to have in, you know, sat with a patient and interpreted that about, oh, so what do you think this, your feelings about the pandemic are saying about your inner life? And, and to, to reduce it back to that uh, would have been impossible, actually. I mean, uh, impossible. I think, you know, so that, 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 that's the, that was the world, that was the outer forcing its way in, you know. I think, you know, it, it kind of said, well, that's enough. That's enough of this mucking around with the inner stuff. Let's, you know, they, they talk about this. This, this matters. But of course, then, you know, one is left with this problem. Well, how do you talk about that? Because if all I'm if all I'm used to talking about is the neuroses of my clients and 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 how uh, you know every every dream points to that and every and and their active imaginations and their and the development of of all sorts of um, inner relationships with inner inner uh, person such as the animal and so what if 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 that's what I'm used to doing how do I how do I turn this around and start talking about the pandemic? Because I don't want to talk about it on a kind of non-psychological way. I don't want to talk about it as, you know, did you see the news today? You know, you know, this is going to happen because then you're just having a chat. You know, you can do that with anyone. So, so what, what can one bring psychologically? How can you, how can you make this psychological? And I think that, that became, uh, that's exactly the, the, the process that I think psychology needs to be doing all the time, which is, bringing together this because i'm not saying that the inner is irrelevant at all i'm not saying you know that the only thing that matters is the political or the the economic or the or the, the you know the whatever catastrophe is going on it's not that but it needs to be seen through the other side so the the inner the archetypal need, and and the outer personal need to be seen through each other so you find a way to address what's going on using and and you know you don't just discard all the archetypal stuff. That's that actually is helpful because it it it, it you know it, it offers us all kinds of ways to talk about this kind of event. But you have to be grounded in what's actually happening as well and what that means. And and because this is new stuff, this really because it's not you know this is the other thing that I think sometimes Jungian psychology the the, the emphasis on the archetypes uh, leads to a kind of um, backward looking. Uh, approach so you know because it's always about looking back to well yes you know you're going through this problem but I think you'll find that this myth here uh, from fifth century Greece actually illustrates something important about that now I'm not saying that that isn't true I'm sure it is true but 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 the, the, it, it starts leading one to think well actually you know is there anything new under the sun because everything can be you know we can find it in, in a Greek myth well I'm not sure that's the case because I think things do change, like you say. I mean, things are actually transforming. The, the, these these events, you know, the, the world is individuating, our culture is individuating. It, you know, and when you come up against something like um, uh, COVID, that's exactly the sort of encounter that that forces a kind of form of individuation. We're not going to be the same afterwards as we were before. Uh, and uh, so that needs to be reflected, I think, within the therapy as well. Now, I'm not saying I know how to do all this. All I'm saying is that that, that it really highlights and points to um, how crucial that inner outer 
you know, engagement is, and it's always been, you know, it's always been the case. It's just that it's particularly apparent when something like this happens. In. Well, maybe that'll be your next book, Mark, yeah. and we'll have you on uh, to talk about that. In, in yeah, I'll have, I'll have all the answers by then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we look forward to that. And I, I just want to thank you for such an illuminating conversation. It's been a delight. Good. Well, well, thank you. I mean, uh, it's it's a pleasure to talk about it. I mean, I've I was very relieved to discover that even though the book actually was published in 2019, apparently I, I still I still agree with it. So that's good to know. It still has traction, and I'm sure yeah, our our, our listeners will find it all very meaningful. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Thank you very much. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org. Thank you to our 2020 donors who gave at the contributing member level and above. Barbara Anan, Usha and Ashok Beatty, Jackie Cabe Bryan, Eric Cooper and Judith Cooper, Kevin Davis, George J. Didier, Mary Doherty, James Fidelibus, John Korolewski, Marty Manning, Diane Sherwood, Deborah P. Stutzman, Deborah Tobin, Alexander Wayne and Lynn Kopp, Gerald Weiner, Karen West and James Taylor, and Ellen Young. If you would like to join our generous community of supporters, just go to youngchicago.org slash give.